Hey, welcome in everybody to the Sports Fanatic News Phillies podcast as we're here to break down the first little bit of the season, the first sample size 10 games here with Andrew Santangelo. Andrew, how are you doing this evening on Easter evening? I hope everybody had a good happy Easter. Yeah, happy Easter everyone. Hope everyone had a good day. Um, I'm doing very well in my in my life, unfortunately, though. The uh, Phillies aren't off to a great start, which obviously would make things better for the both of us. So uh, hopefully that can change pretty quick. Yeah, the Phillies aren't off to the, a great start. Uh, the Phantoms aren't a fantastic team. The Flyers aren't a fantastic team. At least the Reading Royals, the team I cover, is in first place in the playoffs. So, you know, there's a silver lining. <laughs> and the Sixers won game one. So. Hey, maybe uh, the Philadelphia Stars can be the best team in Philly. Yeah. The Union, are, aren't the Union doing solid? Oh no! Yeah, the Union are first place. I was just since the Stars had their first ever uh, franchise game in the USFL or whatever that league's called today. Um, oh god! Gotcha, yeah, I thought I'd throw that out there. Unfortunately, they lost them. So, gotcha. They have that crazy mascot that people are saying is Gritty's cousin. That yeah. blob dude looks like yeah. a character. Looks like a character from Monsters in, or Monsters University. It does. One. It does. Yeah, it does look like a character from Monsters Universe. But anyway, enough about that. Uh, <laughs> into the into the uh, Phillies um, season here, as we got off to a good start. So the first thing, since we haven't um, talked to each other yet with a podcast, because Andrew's really busy doing it. Assistant athletic director, great work down there, announcing games, all that yada yada you do at Northwestern Oklahoma State. I've been covering so our schedules don't match up. Um, we're going to kind of talk about what the ailments have been that led to the Phillies not being as great as we thought they would be coming into this season thus far. But we did get off to a good start of a nine to five um, win. And Aaron Nola, of course, through six innings of that game. Uh, was really sharp in that game, and they hit a very good pitcher, Rock, or Rocky, uh, Frankie Montas, in game one. But what is your take on, I know some people uh, were pissed that it seemed like because of the sort of preseason, they pushed him a little bit, letting him go to the seventh when it looked like he was tiring already in the sixth. What was your take on that, Stan? I mean, listen, we don't we don't know what goes on behind doors and all, what goes on at practice and everything. So we, my, my take is I, I trust Joe Girardi. I trust the trainers. I trust the rest of the coaching staff to do what's best. I, I think that's where people forget. I mean, I have no issue with them leaving Nolan. I understand it was a shortened spring, but if you should go back three years when we had Gabe Kapler here the first time, everyone complained when they took Nola out. So that's just proof on how you can't win as a manager. And for me, I have no issue with it because that's me putting the trust in the, the guys that work with Aaron Ola every day. And that's me putting the trust in Aaron Ola that he's willing to tell them when he can't go anymore. So I have no issues with it. Yeah. See, from that perspective, I didn't have an issue with it. The reason from my perspective I had an issue with it is we worked so hard to get the bullpen better that I feel in game one, you might as well go off of a great six innings, put Familia, Hand, Dominguez, Knievel in, and just kind of bank off of the great bullpen that you, not the great bullpen, but the better bullpen that you built with with uh, Dave Dombrowski. That's the only reason. Like, if this was last year with uh, that bullpen, I would be looking at this totally differently. But now that you have the horses in the cage, so to speak, in the bullpen, I, I would kind of um, say you should – maybe lean towards that sooner in game one just because we've seen many games. I mean, hell, we saw Clayton Kershaw get removed from a perfect game. So we've seen a lot of like, guys not get over-pushed so far early because of spring training being short and in rush. That's the only reason I would kind of look at it. Um, I Not that Nolan necessarily isn't good enough to get pushed further in game one. It's more if you have a bullpen that's good enough to not push somebody, why push somebody? See, That's I look at like, it as – sorry, I thought you were done. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I look at it more as if it was a 3-1 to one game, I think they would have pulled them. But I think when you're sitting at a 6-1 to one game, you have a chance to stretch them out for future – like you have a chance to stretch them out a little bit more and take an extra risk to get him ready for his next – for start number two and start number three to go deeper. Because if he gives up a mistake pitch, you're still sitting fine inside the game. So I think if it was a 2-1, 3-1 game, 
then yes, I think you pull him because of the bullpen improvements, like you said. But I think because it was a six one, I think that was an opportunity for them to stretch him to try to get him ready for the season to go farther, if that makes sense. In my perspective, at least. Okay, that makes sense. My whole thing is just if you're trying to win the game, which is obviously the main key, it's tough to take risks, even if you're playing a team as mediocre as the A's, I'll say it that way, uh, this season. Uh, they're still a major league baseball team where they did almost kind of bite us in the butt uh, a little bit because it became a closer game, 9-5, to five, compared to what it was. But uh, it didn't in the end, so it's kind of all's well that ends well, I guess, uh, so to speak. But, no, we got off to a good start, like we said. But before we go into the next game, since I brought that up, um, and this is kind of – we talk I talk about, obviously, and you have with me as well, overall baseball stuff on the show. What if you were Dave Roberts? What were you doing in that situation? <laughs> um, are you removing Clayton Kershaw from a perfect game, or are you saying no? This is a perfect game. You're not really a flamethrower anymore. You kind of have a rubber arm because you throw eighty-eight to ninety-one at this point. Like, what would be your decision in that factor? I, I would have left him in the game personally because yes, we want him to get the perfect game, but honestly. If I'm looking at, at their perspective and the way Clayton Kershaw t- took the press conference after, I-, I think those two were kind of on the same page to remove him. I think with his injury history the past couple of years, I think with, again, the short and spring, he wasn't really ready. And with an older pitcher, he's not, he's not a young guy out there where you can stretch him. He's an older guy. You don't want his arm to hurt. I mean, we look what happened to Verlander a few, uh, two years ago. He missed all last year. So uh, I yeah. just... I respect that tough decision by Dave Roberts. Did I disagree with it? Yeah, because I'm a fan and I don't have to worry about the future of the team because I want to see him throw that perfect game. But I, I respect Dave Roberts and, and his decision to make that tough call and, and pull him in a situation like that. And by Kershaw's answer of, I think he said something like, well, obviously the fans want to see it go or something like that. He didn't seem too upset. So something tells me they were kind of on the same page there. I think they were kind of on the same page. I did see, I think it was Fergie, uh, somebody, one of the old-timer pitchers tweeted about it and said, like, I would pitch through a broken arm or something like that to try to throw a perfect game. Um, Where uh, I think, obviously, that's extreme. But I think the uh, passing, like, when it's not, this has only been done the next time. If it's a no-hitter, that's one thing, because no-hitters have been done countless times at this point and they're becoming more common honestly rather than less common in the last 10 years but if it's a perfect game that's gonna be done i think it's like 27 or something well like something like that times in the history of baseball that's why that's in the rarest precipice i would have tried to let it go a little bit longer but like yeah i respect the decision for the fact that yeah your manager has to make a tough decision but like if I was the manager of the team and he came up to me and said, I'm ready to come out, I would literally be looking at him like, you, like really? Like, you're actually ready to come? But, like, I would be shocked. Like, it, like my immediate reaction would be like, okay, cool, yeah. We'll go to the bullpen. It would be like, oh, you're serious. Okay, damn, all right. All right, cool, yeah, I'll go get somebody up. <laughs> like, that would be more my immediate reaction. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, that kind of goes where uh, I kind of said with the opener with Gerard is, that's where we don't know what's going on back behind scenes and everything. So for all we know, the trainers and Kershaw could have been saying, all right, that's it. But you know what? It comes out on the manager. He's the one making that decision. He's the one that gets the fault and everything. But for all we know, like you just said, Kershaw could have said he's done. But we're never going to know that. Yeah, that is true. But anyway, back into our Philadelphia Phillies. You did mention Justin Verlander, too, who's off to a flaming start. So that's good to see in his return. Yeah, him- he's- off to immense in the guard. Shout yeah, to yeah. Both, them. <clears throat> both are off to flip. And then obviously the Angels uh, have been looking for something like that for years. So if he can stay healthy at the top of the rotation, it's been basically since Jared Weaver, since they've had a great guy at the top yeah. of that rotation. Um, but when it comes to our Phillies, we got off to a back to back good start. Um, this guy will come back to later since he's been pretty good in all in all. But Kyle Gibson. Um, in that second game, how I mean, he was absolutely 
brilliant in that game. Seven innings, only two hits, 10 strikeouts for a non-strikeout pitcher. Alvarado was wild in that game, wasn't the best. But then Knievel came in and closed it out. Uh, what was your view on just Gibson's dominance? Uh, just one start the season, kind of, but definitely in game two. I thought the movement on his pitches were, were fantastic. I think it's something we didn't really see last year. I felt like and they never really came out and said it, but I felt like watching those games day in and day out last year compared to him on the Rangers and then the way we saw his movement to start this year, I think he had a little bit of a dead arm toward the end of last season. And we obviously they never came out and said it because I mean, he doesn't want to pull that excuse card. But I, I think – the movement on his pitches in game one and the way he was able to strike out batters, I, th- I think that goes to show there was something wrong last year. And that makes sense for how dominant he was the first half of last year and then the second half slowed down. So I'm interested to see as the season progresses um, if he's able to keep that up. And obviously, you know, he didn't look as sharp in game two, but with the short and spring, I mean, that, that that's going to happen. Yeah, and also in game two, I thought for the first few innings, like the first couple innings, he still had decent movement on his pitches. He was just missing off the plate and then battled well. And then the we'll get to that game in a bit, but then kind of the, the gates opened a little bit because he didn't have his best control. But I didn't think it was anything to the degree of wheels today where he just didn't have it at all. Uh, where like I thought Gibson definitely battled more than Wheeler was able to do today, so to speak, in that second story. But we we can we can get to that in a in a minute. Uh, when it came to uh, the final game of the series, though, this is an interesting take, kind of in the reverse way. Um, we lost this game, of course. Dalton Jeffries, maybe he's going to be the random dude that comes out of nowhere for the A's this year and becomes a very good pitcher because you know they seem to have one of those guys every season. Um, pitch five innings, two hits. Two baseballs, two strikeouts against the Phillies, doing nothing very complicated, just throwing strikes at about 91 to 92 miles per hour. Um, Zach Eflin, though, four innings, two hits, two baseballs, three strikeouts, said in his post game he thought he could have went an extra inning. What's your take on if uh, Eflin should have went five or not? I mean, it's. I think it's a situation where it, it was the right time. I mean, he showed signs of, of falling apart a little bit the ending before. Um, the A's got to him a little bit, uh, and again, you you have to you have to be care- I don't know you have to be careful with it. And, and I don't know the way he's feeling, obviously. And uh, I like well, from what he said, it sounded like he like he like they straight up asked him and he said I thought I could have won another inning but like basically I respect the decision to be nice but in hindsight from what I took from that is I don't really respect the decision I just have to say that <laughs> like like that that that's more what I took from that in my own opinion yeah and maybe that's right I just think um, you look at it where. Again, he's a guy that's had a lot of injuries in the past. He's a guy that hasn't looked as sharp in the past. He's a guy that um, started, yeah, yeah, I think one or two less starts in the spring as well. So, I mean, it's just the way the managers are managing right now. They're playing the cautious route. Um, I don't think he has lever- as much leverage as a guy like Nola or Wheeler. So, uh, I think that's something he's got to earn is basically what Girardi's telling him. Yeah, I agree with that. I just thought it was 68 pitches, 42 for strikes. I just pulled it up. I would have let him go one more just because Bailey Falter at this point, like he started off hot for his first, I want to say, like four games of his career. Since then, he's basically just been an innings eater. So I wouldn't, like, I don't want to put him in in the fifth. Like, I would much rather, one, not put him in at all as a middle reliever and then just go straight to Brogdon, like they ended up going to for two thirds of an inning, who's now down, but he was. He pitched fine in that game. Uh, or Jones earlier, even over Falter, who pitched better than him in that game. Uh, so, like, uh, it's more you kind of want to delay. Like, you don't – going to your middle relievers is never something you want to do, where I feel like in that game they could have delayed it by what he said himself. That's why I didn't agree with the Joe's decision, per se, in that game myself, just because when the pitcher himself says, yeah, I, feel, I felt really good that I could have won another inning. 
that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with Kershaw listening to the pitcher. I would have listened to the pitcher if I was Joe Girardi. That is, and said, okay, let's give, give me five innings. Because that just benefits the team even more if he is able to give five innings. And putting in Bailey Fulton in the fifth inning doesn't really do anything. <laughs> that, that's, all, that's all I'm saying. No, yeah, I it's, hear you. Especially in a game your offense was dead, that's not a game you want to put Bailey Fulton in, in the fifth inning. Like, like when Eflin at least looks solid, even though he was starting to tire, I agree, in the fourth. When your offense doesn't look awake in that game and a guy well, like Dolan They Jeffrey, didn't lose that game because of fault. They lost that game because the offense did not score a run. Oh, no, no. I completely agree with you. But that that's a game you don't want to put falter in that early, like a middle reliever, like a Jones or a falter that are innings just that are probably going to give up two runs. You don't want to put those guys in early in a game that your offense is dead because then you're just – giving yourself an even bigger gap that you have to climb that mountain when your offense is already not being able to do anything. So that's more of the other side of it as well, uh, that I kind of looked at that decision sideways when I thought Eflin was tiring a bit, but then when he said that in the post game, it even made me double back on when I initially thought we should have let him go five. And then when he said that, I was like, well, they definitely should have let him go five. So that was you, the, the you first players decision. always say that they're fine when they're not Oh, no, fine. I agree. I do agree, but that's the first decision of the year in my book that I disagree with Joe Girardi. That's all. Like, the, there's always going to be times that I disagree with Kirk. I disagree with not every move that each Flyers coach had this year. So, uh, like, don't be surprised if this isn't the list. <laughs> I, I disagree with a move by a coach. It's just something that I can do at times. But, uh, but um, that that's just the first move of the season that I kind of went. I don't really agree with that one that much. But at the same time, I agree with all the stuff Joe has done, like giving Johan Camargo the extra playing time because he's hitting good and he's a very good fielder. Those moves I agree with, uh, leading off JT in the game yesterday. Uh, I agreed. I thought I was fine with that move. But like, there's always a positive to every negative, but like that's a move that I did not not, not agree with. I thought I saw that as more of a negative. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, listen, they're they're desperate to find something on the offensive end at this point. I'm, out, I'm all for any any pickup Girardi's going to try in terms of the batting order and. I think you're almost desperate for it at this point. You're 10 games in. Your offense has struggled pretty much every game outside uh, the first game of the season. Um, I know they came back to beat the bets, but that was only a, a one-inning hurrah. Um, yesterday, I mean, obviously, the 10-run the Marlins game was pretty good, but still. 4-2 is not terrible. I mean, it's not like you would like to score more than you would, but that game against the A's, like, four runs is terrible. Like, if you average four runs a game, you're probably going to be a pretty good baseball team. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, but they're relying but, too much on, like, one-inning games and stuff. No, exactly. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, they're relying, they're relying way too much on scoring later than the sixth inning. That's why this team has been one of the most frustrating teams to watch early that, like, if there's something else, like, for example, the NBA playoffs or, like, I'll have that on my other TV and be paying attention to that more than the damn Phillies game at times because the Phillies game is just so boring or annoying by the way that they're playing because they just, especially that game with Dalton Jeffries where everybody was just swinging at anything thrown into the radius of the strike zone. Like, it, like that game was like, oh, the ball's near the strike zone. Cool. Like That looked like a 15-year-old playing MLB The Show where Matt Faskersen's like, oh, he couldn't hit that one with an oar. Like, that's literally what that, what that game looked like. And I'm like, what are you guys swinging? <laughs> like, that was ridiculous. But anyway, moving past that ridiculous game, <laughs> we go into a game where the Phillies, it looked like our season was starting good. We were first in the NL East after winning this game 5-4 and 3-1. and one. Uh, The Mets, we beat them 5-4. to four. Sir Anthony Dominguez got the win. Seth Lugo got the loss. And Brad Hand came in and had a really good, actually, ninth inning. That decision, I actually agreed with Joe because I thought the way the lineup was stacked up actually made sense for Brad Hand. Absolutely. And he also is a very good closer. So that decision, I've agreed. Well, well he's a solid closer, but he's a guy that has closing experience. So I agreed with that decision. Dominguez did good. Nick Nelson came in and probably pitched the best game of his entire career. Um, and then Ranger Suarez was sloppy in that game, but I don't blame him because he didn't really have a spring training and it was his first game. But uh, what was your takes kind of on the pitching in that game? Um, I thought through and through, everybody kind of basically just picked them up. 
picked up Ranger Suarez, which is exactly what you want to see when you built your bullpen to be improved this year. Yeah, and I think the the whole negative about Ranger Suarez is first starts a little overblown because of how bad the defense was. I mean, you have three errors in three innings. Your one error costs you a double play and um, allows the run the score on, on the overthrow. Throw, just a very poor decision to throw the ball. So I honestly didn't think he looked all that bad. Did he look as sharp as last year? No, but I don't think he looked that bad, and he could have got out of that with a lot less pitches and then another run or two off the board. So I actually, what, especially for how limited of a spring was with the whole uh, late start, I felt that uh, he actually honestly looked good. Yeah, I didn't think he looked poor in the game. I thought he, like you said, it was a he was basically the maker of bad performance around around him early in that game where uh, he didn't get good defense. Basically, it's like it's almost like the equivalency to a goaltender that plays really good, but his stats don't look fantastic because everybody's wide open in front of the damn net. Yeah, like like you're not gonna you're not gonna turn into Harry Houdini and just appear where the fuck's gonna go. So it's the same thing. You're not going to have a pitcher turn into, like, basically Mark Burley and just be able to do these ridiculously unhumane fielding plays where the dude's falling on his back and doing a backflip and somehow throwing it to first base. Like, like no, not many people can do that. So um, I, I think that's the perfect, honestly, thing. The fielding bit them in the butt in that game early. But the biggest thing I took from that game was perseverance which is something I hope uh, becomes a going trait with this team since we're obviously struggling now, and that's what we're going to get to soon. Perseverance kind of becomes a going trait uh, with the team because, of course, that second game of the Mets series was, again, destroyed us offensively. Zach Wheeler, though, um, the, the that was fine. He was five through four and two thirds. Christopher Sanchez was five through two and two thirds. Brogdon was okay. And Familia was okay. So the pitching was fine. It's just, we got absolutely killed. Now he had a very good first start too. And Reese Hoskins did say after the A series, he actually talked about Tyler McGill and said, they have that McGill kid. That's pretty good. Well, that came to fruition. (laughs) Five and a third innings, three hits, five strikeouts. Basically, they just dominated us that game when it came to pitching, and they got two runs and just didn't look back. Yeah, I mean, Philly's got silenced that game, and unfortunately, the the Mets pitching was just too much. We left guys on base. We had a couple different opportunities, but just not a good game overall. Um, Like you said, we all looked good to start, but definitely showed fatigue there in in the middle innings, and that's when it kind of fell apart for this team. And unfortunately, that evened up the series at the time, which uh, we know what happened in the end. But no, I mean, in the end, it was, it was one game. Um, it was more about how you respond, which is what we'll get into here in a little bit. Yeah, well, the response wasn't great to that game because the only reason the game was close in the final game of the Mets series, or in the 9-6 to six loss in the Mets series, was... Because you scored guard, like you scored, what was it, three in the last three innings, I think? I mean, it was only three runs before that. So, like, it really wasn't as close as the scoreboard makes it out to look, so to speak. Where the Mets through this game did have way better, at least in my own opinion, had way better control of the game than we ever were able to grasp. Uh, Jones pitched a solid first game, pitched crap in this game. This is the game that basically probably got Connor Brogdon sent down. Uh, Jose Alvarado did respond in this game, and Bailey Falter responded with a decent two innings in this game. Uh, but Aaron Nola was not the Aaron Nola you want to see at all. I would, I think you would agree with me in this one. He struggled a lot in that game. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, he he did his last year's form, and he dominated the first three or four innings, and it was a. It was a tremendous pitching matchup. It was a tremendous pitching duel between him and Max Scherzer. I mean, the, the first classic, three. Yeah. Yeah, the, first, the classic Nola Scherzer we saw in the Nationals. It's a fun matchup. The Phillies offense wasn't able to take advantage of three walks in the first inning. Allowed Mets to gain some momentum from there, and then they eventually got the Nola. 
And I think it got to like 7 1 before we pulled Max, or before the Mets pulled Max. At that point, it was just too late. And like you said, you, you talk about the garbage points that some quarterbacks can get and stuff in football. Well, that's what the Phillies got. They got the garbage time runs, making it making it appear close, but it really wasn't. But I was disappointed with, obviously, the middle stuff, middle innings, but I was more disappointed with the offense. You get three walks in the first inning, and you're not able to take advantage of it, exactly. especially with the mo- moves you made in the offseason. This is supposed to be the strong point. Up until that point in the Mets series, they, they just have not come through. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, you've had moments where I've been more impressed with pitchers, like, for example, Norwood, who we'll get to in a second, and Bilotti, who I didn't even know who he was, to be quite honest, until he came into the game. I, and I pay attention. Like, like Andrew knows how much I like paying attention to the double, at least double A up, and I could not tell you who the heck that guy was. And either could uh, what's his name that tweeted about it and it's like, oh yeah, the, oh yeah, Andrew Bellotti. And then he put like question mark with like the like magnifying glass emoji, I think. Um, but like he 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 pitched with a raise years ago and actually pitched good in twenty fifteen, but for some reason didn't pitch at all until last season with the fish, again in the bigs. And then now it's pitched two good games with us. But <clears throat> um yeah, there's been more impressive pitching early than hitting and fielding than hitting uh, in, on a couple of plays as well because Stotts made a couple of plays that have impressed me. Has he hit well, Muziotti? No, but he made those couple of plays in the field. And then, obviously, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gene Segura has made a couple of nice plays in the uh, field as well. So, like, th- like that's not the things I would have ever thought I would have been talking about <laughs> when, no. when it came to the start of this, the, the, this season. And the other thing is, I never thought I would be saying in the first week of the season, oh, you know who one of the MVPs of the teams is? Johan Camargo. Good for him. Absolutely fantastic for him. Because if he can be our first base or first baseman, third baseman, he's by far the best fielder in our lineup. So that would actually work out great if he can at least be a fraction of his 2018 form. That would be fantastic. But I did not expect that. So, like, that's ridiculous. Boom has turned into Jesus since he admitted to what he said and uh, everybody gave him a standing ovation. So now you have a guy that all of a sudden decided that, at least hitting wise, he's Miguel Cabrera since that happened. So if that continues to happen, that's great. <laughs> um, the, that's also a question I wanted to pose too, because with how good Boom's doing when he's in the lineup, even if it's DHing since we've let off a DH, so we just try to let him lead off at this point since he's been hitting the all fields. It's probably the best we've seen him since his rookie year. No, I don't think he can lead off, though. I think it, with, with him, especially you see in the fielding problems, with being a leadoff hitter, I guess, to some people, you got to have the right mindset. And I, and I don't trust Bone in that sense as a leadoff hitter. Okay. I, I, I like the guy. I think he, obviously he can make strides, but. I think he's better suited for, for anywhere from like the five to seven range, probably for Boom. Maybe, maybe try him with a two hole if you're benching some other people. But um, for the most part, no, nah, I'd avoid him lead off. I don't think he he strikes strikes me well as a as a good lead off hitter. Okay, no, I was just curious. I mean, to me, I w- I'm not ready to put him there yet. But it's like everybody else fails there and he just continues to hit, I might be willing to try it by default, so to speak. But I do agree with you. I don't think structurally he's the best leadoff hitter at all, but it's just if he's the best hitter out of people that, and then everyone else has struggled in that position, you might just give it a shot at some point. But JT did do well, of course, in the game. Uh, We won in the Marlins series, but We'll get to that soon. He also did very good in the first game that we lost, having four at-bats and four hits, bringing his average up to 360 at that given moment. And then Johan Camargo in that game was after 429 at that given moment. Basically, this guy's turning into Wade Boggs. Um, but anyway, uh, Gibson in that game was kind of how how you were saying, hitting at it a little bit, beginning of a game, almost Nola, struggle Nola-esque. Beginning of the game, he was able to battle and do good. And then it fell off of the wheels in the fourth inning. And um, he, he kind of fell apart. Bellotti came in, pitched his first good game. My new favorite person, James Norwood, came in and pitched a good inning. 
Uh, Brad Hand, Corey Knebel pitched well. Um, so uh, I think that spells good success when you have – because this is the second time. We talked about it in the game Ranger pitch, and now we're talking about it in the game Gibson pitch. I think a positive sign is we've seen the bullpen a couple times already pick up a bad starting performance. But obviously a bad sign of this game is 4-3. to three, You lose to the fish, get beat by Kentara pitching great. Bender, who's not the most brilliant closer, pitching a great uh, – well, not a great game of two hits, but being able to still close it out against you, so to speak. So, like, the Marlins don't have the best bullpen. They have more of a better starting rotation than bullpen. And you still got dominated by the full penny after Alcatara came in. Yeah, my one concern, and I, like, I agree, it does help that they're picking you up a little bit. But my concern is you're taxing the bullpen very, very early. In this That's season. a good point. And I'm very, I'm worried because you got some good arms, but you got some older arms too. So I'm worried about if you're going to overuse hand, if you're going to use familiar. We know Knievel's injury history already. So that's my concern is while, yes, we have picked up some starters already, is our bullpen going to be able to last that for a full season just because of the, the known structure of them in the past? Yeah. No, that's a good point. I was just trying to look at in a season that's pissed me off more than brought me up this year uh, positive. Oh, no. But, yeah, yeah. That's, a nah. fair, that's, a fair, that's definitely a fair way to put it, yeah. And I completely agree. I'm just sitting here saying the other side that that's my one concern. And obviously, from years past, I love to see this. Our bullpen's always been the issue in years past. So the fact that we actually went out and made moves is tremendous. It just thinks that the whole lockout and everything has completely took like a whole turn for this team. And and I'm not making it as an excuse. I'm saying what concerns me going forward was that is the after effects of all that. So yeah. That's my concern. And, yeah, obviously, I think we all agree the offense has been the biggest problem to start the season, and you saw it here in this game, too. Because, you, like you said, when you chased Alcantara out of the game, you weren't able to hit in pretty much all series. You weren't able to hit a bad bullpen. Yeah, because yeah, the Marlins' strength and Trevor Plouffe, who, which I like listening to that baseball, whatever the uh, yeah, show John, is on John Boy. John Boy, Plouffe, yeah, like, uh, it's called Talking Chris Rose Baseball. Do. Uh, well, Talking Baseball is the one that he's on with Jake and – um. Yeah, Jim, I'm talking, talking about. about. I'm talking about the one that he does with Rose. That's the shorter 30 minute one. Talking baseball is like three hours. So I only watch parts of it. Uh, but the one that's like the 30 minute, like whatever it is, um, <clears throat> Ploof kind of hit it on the head with the Marlins. They're still a kind of dark horse, dangerous team because their starting rotation is good and they have Jazz Chisel and Sanchez, all those guys that we saw. Um, Wendell's a decent role player. Uh, so you have Garcia as well, De La Cruz, who's continuing to develop, he brought in Solaire. But the problem with them is they have a weakness in the bullpen. But the Phillies made their bullpen look as strong as their starting rotation, which is the problem I had with that first game of the series, which is what you just hit on as well. And then Pablo Lopez, who basically pitches like Sandy Koch, well, he, he's right-handed, he basically pitches like Tom Seaver against us, uh, is literally – dominated the Phillies again and pitched five and a third innings, bringing his ERA to 1-0, 0.87, uh, two walks. Uh, Heed came in, pitched one and a third, and then Armstrong and Castano. Uh, Armstrong they were able to get to for at least one run, but, but Castano came in and closed the door on the Phillies as they got smoked in that game. Zach Eflin and Nick Nelson, after pitching a great first game, struggled mightily in this game against the Fish. Andrew Bellotti came in and pitched good again. And then Yuris Familia came in and pitched good as well. <clears throat> this game was a loss caused by the fifth inning. <laughs> it was the four problem, nothing. Been too many of them. Yeah, the, yeah, there's been way too many. Yeah, yeah that's, that is the issue. There's been, there's been a lot of games I just shut off and watched something else and then watched the condensed game the next day. <laughs> and that's, right. that's the frustrating part is you went out and made moves where – Okay, it's not like years past where you go down three runs, game's over. No, you go down three runs, this offense should be able to pick you up. The problem is they don't. They have one and two. It's not like you're going down three runs this time. It's you're giving up four run innings and you're going down seven one a few times. And we talked about it, that third game in the Mets series. Um, obviously, we'll get to today's and then this one you mentioned and pretty much the whole Marlins series. But like it, it's you're not you're not even giving your chance. 
you're not even giving the offense a chance to come back at some of them. But the offense has been so bad, too. Mm-hmm. And the Phillies, we thought, moving back up to third in the East, uh, moving to four and five after their 10-3 win when they were not on television. Maybe that's the key. Just stop putting them on television. Um, but they won 10-3 to over Trevor Rogers, who's a guy that I honestly thought was going to have our number yet again, but he did not as we really would nominate him. And then Ranger Suarez, how you talked about how his stuff looked sharp in game one, but he didn't get help from the defense in this one. He did allow six hits, but I thought actually, and three walks. But what I loved about this game is the battle. Like we saw with Ranger last year when he didn't always have his fantastic stuff, he still battled and pitched you at least five innings. And that's exactly what he did in this game. Still got four Ks, um, pitched a really solid overall game, even though he probably had like his C plus level stuff that day that's why it's so impressive when you have a guy that's only in his second full year in the league that's able to be that much of a battle and that's one of the main things i took from the pitching side of it the other thing was my boy james norwood pitched another good game uh dominguez did good and then bailey falter also responded from having a bad first out it so um those are all good things as well but the key to obviously this game was the lineup actually doing what we hope it starts doing more consistently eventually, which is having guys hit and specifically having more hits out of center field since Veerling had a big double in this game and actually had two hits in this game. Uh, he also had a single uh, in the game uh, later on as well. Uh, Boom continued to hit really well and rake in this game. Camargo continued to rake in this game. Castellanos, who's having a hell of a star, continued to rake in this game. So those guys, that the, the issue I have with this game is Boom's been doing good. Castellanos been doing good. Um, Harper has struggled a little bit, so he stepped up in that game. Uh, Didi, I've actually really liked his at-bats early on, even when he's got out. So, like, these are all guys that have actually liked how they performed that really stepped up for us. We need the rest of the people that are why the lineup's not doing good because all these guys that actually have performed are always up with nobody on base. Like, you always have Johan Camargo up with two outs, nobody on, and it's like, well, he's been hitting well early, but what, do you, what, what is he going to do? He's not a home run hitter, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I will say I think I've seen some uh, intriguing signs the last couple of days from from Harper. I, I think obviously he's gotten a slow start, but in, in his last three his last two two games, he's four of nine home run, four RBI. So I think he's fine. He just got up to slow start. He's turned the corner. Hoskins is a good has been off to a better start, but he's struggled the last few games. But I. I, I the offense is going to come around. I think it's one of those. They just need to take a couple games together. We haven't seen them click yet. And once they click, it's going to be dangerous. But the other problem is you're basically hitting with a, a seven-man lineup right now with with the uncertainty of center field, the uncertainty of who who's going to be at short. We saw Segura get hit, and he had to miss a couple games already. So you, you've kind of been playing. Yeah, he was doing good. On to he, he's kind of only played game. with a seven man man lineup sometimes, and if maybe extended to an eight man lineup, but outside of that, well, you're still hitting, you're still missing a guy or two each night. So <clears> once <throat> they click, it'll be fine. And that's it's only 10 games, and I'm not worried. It's funny seeing people panicking already on Twitter. It's like, guys, we'll be fine. It's just, just a matter of time. And I know it stinks losing these division games early, but. And I think you have to take them more importantly than some people do to realize. But in reality, like, if you think about it, the last couple of years, we've actually got off to good starts and you missed the playoffs anyway. So it's not about how you start. It's going to be about how we finish each each uh, each month. And I think as long as you're playing a little above 500 at the end of the month, you're, you're fine. I mean, yeah, you can't go down 10 games, but... We're going to get another crack at the Mets at the end. You play them the last week of, of April. So if you go out and switch, you get two out of three in that one, you're looking fine. So I'm not panicking yet way too early, but it, it does stink where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I agree with both sides. I kind of see it from the both. Like, I see exactly what you're saying from, from, from the other perspective. I think it's like Shane I saw. <laughs> tweeted out who we used to do the always next year podcast with, of course. 
like people have the right because the Phillies have to earn our patience because they haven't earned our patience, basically. Uh, it's kind of like how people say you have to earn respect. It's not given. You kind of have to earn patience as well, where the Flyers have not earned my patience. And the Phillies have not earned my patience since the 2011 season. So, like, I think it's more when it comes to that and you can pound it with sucking against the Marlins again, minus one game in a four game series to even add more salt to the wound, not even a three game series. You lose a four game series to the fish. Um, That I think is why people are frustrated early where I feel like a lot of the stuff on Twitter too. Like I know some of the people I follow, like since I have rapport with them on Twitter DMs, like I know half of the stuff they say that's negative is mostly just sarcasm to get people to react to. Cause I'll even tweet that stuff sometimes like the sarcastic humor stuff, like, Earlier, like the, I forget what. Oh, the like I tweeted about the Flyers, which you could say about the Phillies lineup, like early on. But I said the Flyers blowing lead must have been one of the big, best new fads of the year that we didn't receive the memo on going into the season. Um, but like that's because people like sarcastic humor. Where I feel like some people are serious and other people are trying to basically just be humorous about it. Like, oh my God, the season is over and the sky is falling. But <laughs> Like that type of um, stuff. But yeah, I'm not, from the perspective of what you said, I'm not worried at all yet, but I see both sides of it because they haven't really earned our patience in recent history. And that's kind of, I think, where people are coming from. Yeah, but it's not, uh, it's a different team. It's not the same thing. Um, you went out. No, I'm not saying it. this team. I'm more saying the organization has. I should have specified that. The but organization no, again, has. It's not the same, though. They haven't made moves to get you to believe, but they went out and made a lot of moves this year. And you look at it, a lot of these guys are used to getting off the slow starts. Kyle Schwarber was a, a 200 hitter in the month of April last year, and he still made the All Star game. Bryce Harper, we, we, we know the slow starts he gets off to. He won MVP last year. So this is just kind of like what some of these guys go through. And. I think it's. And I, I think. Don't get me wrong. It's frustrating. I don't want to be four and six right now. But I mean, you go out and beat Colorado two out of three here this week. You're sitting at six and seven. You're coming back home. You get you get a day off, and, and you're looking just fine. No, I agree with that. That's why I'm not panicking at all. I'm just saying. With, I've kind of grown to try to see both sides of things at this point where I kind of see where people come from from being impatient just because it's been frustrating watching this team. But at the same time, there are a team that, like you said, has the much stronger lineup on paper. It's just they haven't come to fruition yet. Where also the Marlins, with how hot their lineup went against us, isn't how consistently hot their lineup is because they got a bunch of young cats that still aren't in their primes yet that are still growing and that are going to have holes in parts of seasons because they're not consistent yet and not fully grown to be what they're going to be. So yeah. um, <clears throat> all that put together, I think, is going to make over time the Phillies kind of balance out. But if they yeah, if they go up in Colorado and suck, well, yeah, then that's going to be when people, I think, start getting way more impatient because Colorado minus the fact that for some reason they signed Chris Bryant. Uh we're are not a team that you look at going, oh, this is the one of the better teams on paper. They're kind of a team that have some guys like the McMahons of the world, the Hampsons, uh, himself, obviously, Bryant, and others that are dangerous, so to speak, hitters, especially up there. Uh, but you should be able to beat them with your lineup hitting in that stadium as well. No, I, I agree with that. But... Um, the final game, I mean, this one's easy. Eliza Hernandez uh, had a good five or six innings, excuse me. Solcer came in, did good. I think that dude used to be with the Orioles. Uh, Bass did good. He did good again. Um, Christopher Sanchez was not as good in this game, but I don't really care because he still ate up innings for us, and that's really all I cared about in this game. So good for him, honestly. I'm fine with what he did. Uh, and then Alvarado pitched blah uh, in this game, given up. But uh, 
I think this was just a bad close. Obviously, for Easter Sunday, I think the easiest way to sum this up before we get into the maybe talking about the Colorado series to end it and then talk about our keys to success in the Colorado series and moving forward. That's just not the game you wanted to see on Easter Sunday, obviously. No, um, Zach Willard didn't have it, uh, which is concerning. He was only hitting like 93, 94 miles per hour, which we used to him seeing 97, 98. So that was very concerning from him. And, I think that's something that's got to change going forward. But again, I think it was just the mix of our starters haven't gone deep at all. We're sitting at a five three eight ERA on the season, which isn't going to cut it. Uh, we we already talked about we like the bullpen makeup and what they've done to improve, but it's not going to matter if your guys can't go past four innings and you're using your your long relievers two three innings a night and your starters are giving up five a game. And that's never going to cut it. And you're going to have the best offense in the league. But if you're giving up five runs in the first three innings, you're not even giving your, your guys a chance to, to battle at that point. You're going down 5 nothing and stuff like that. So today's on Zach Wheeler. Uh, he didn't give the team much of a chance to win. Uh, then you bring in Christopher Sanchez. He didn't look too good either. And in the blink of an eye, you were down seven runs already. So today was on the pitching. Uh, I get the offense didn't really hit. But they didn't really have a chance to either. I think for the majority of the season, I'd say it's only offense. But today's game was, was strictly on the pitching. Okay. I would say it was a little bit more 70-30, so to speak, mostly on the pitching. But I feel like the offense can kind of pick. You can get battle back into a game. Like, I've seen Boston do that a lot over the years watching them as well. So, I feel like you can battle back in the games you're down by six if you have a good one or two. No, you, you absolutely can, but it's not ideal. No, no, no. It's not ideal at all. I'm just saying from the devil's advocate perspective. But um, as we move into our final wrap, the Phillies face a guy in game one of the series against the Colorado Rockies. Uh, that will be tomorrow at what time is this game? 8.40 p.m. Uh Chad Cool, who kind of is a weird cat because he, with the Pirates, was always one of those stuff people that the analytics crew would say, like, when he figures it out, he should be a better pitcher because he has the movement, he has all the yada yada, but like all that stuff, basically. Um, we'll see if that's this year. So far, it's been good for him in a start, 2085 Ks after that. The guy that has the best sample size against him is struggling Schwarber against him, who only hits 176 and 17 at bats. And then a solid uh, size by Castellanos, who's hits 250 against him with four RBIs and 16 at bats. Harper struggles in eight at bats, but does have three RBIs, only hitting 125. So, and then Real Muto in four at bats, it has two hits all three. So, um, I think. Uh, He's a guy you can hit around. It obviously is going to depend if he has the stuff of that first start, because like I said, he's kind of a stuffs guy that's been lacking location in his career. and basically gets bit in the ass because he leaves him right over the plate because he gets in too many 3-2 counts or 2-1 counts or 3-1 counts, so to speak, uh, where if he's a guy that's sharp, then he does have the stuff to be a good four starter. Uh, what do you think um, are – in roads are against him as we have Aaron Nola who struggled after the sixth inning in the first start and struggled big time in the second start going up against Charlie Blackman, Chris Bryant, who he struggles against in his career too. I didn't realize how bad he was against Chris Bryant. McMahon hits 250 and eight at bats against Nola. The Rockies lineup actually has good numbers against, <laughs> against Aaron Nola. So what are your, uh, ask for, what do you think is going to happen in that game? <clears throat> I want to see a more patient approach. I wasn't, I didn't hate it today, but we've had a very aggressive approach this season. And I don't think it's gone well for us so far, obviously. Um, so I want to see more of a patient approach to the plate tomorrow and see how that can bode well for this team uh, going forward. So I, that's what I want to see out of it. I, I think you need good NOLA. I get it's Coors Field, and hopefully Coors Field can help our offense turn around. But until we see the offense turn around, we need some good pitching. I want, I want to see a, a six-inning game, maybe three runs from Nola, and, and get a quality start from a starter. Uh, I don't know. Outside that Gibson start, I don't know if we've had a quality start. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
because uh, Nola ended up. Well, technically, more. Nola, if you count that uh, sixth inning, they pushed him to the seventh inning as a quality because today's game isn't a quality start nowadays. Considered like five and something instead of the six and or whatever it used to be when we were younger. Not it's six and three, so that technically it's not a quality start. Giving up four runs, like you go nine. Nine innings and give up four runs, and that doesn't count as a quality start because uh, it's at least six innings of three runs or less, um, is the quote unquote MLB ter- terminology of it. So, um, but yeah, I think even if you count that Nola start, though, that's just count it for the sake of the Philly stats. That's like, only like, two. It, yeah, you have, you have two quality starts in 10 games. Like, that's that's not going to cut it. So, I mean, we need. We need good Nola tomorrow. I want to see him go at least six innings. Give your bullpen a little bit of rest there. Because here's the other thing. We haven't had a day off yet. So these guys have been rotating in terms of the bullpen. So they could use a, a solid start from the starter as much as anybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, Well, that's the reason why they, I think some guys have gone down, too. And up. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily because they don't have confidence in those guys. I think it's because they want to bring fresh guys up, put other guys back yeah. down in the high valley. But for, like, I think it's basically how hockey does it a lot. When you have the emergency call-ups because of injuries and getting fresh legs in, so to speak. No, I completely agree. So, if you get a six-inning game from Nola, I think you, I think you get a win. Yeah, no, I agree with that. My my worry is there's a lot of guys on the uh, Rockies, especially Charlie Black, that murders Aaron Nola, and then I did not realize until looking at this how much Chris Bryant murders Aaron Nola. But if he can actually pitch well and keep the ball down. That's the key in Coors Field, right? He's been leaving the ball up in the seventh inning of that game, and especially in the last start, he left the ball up a lot. His key is if he can keep the ball down and have that good snap on his breaking ball, that's your bread and butter in Coors Field. If you start leaving pitches up, you're screwed. Like, that's why Chad Cole worries me a bit, not because he's a great pitcher. He's a mediocre to average pitcher in his career, but the last year or so has been showing signs of improvement, but he's a guy that is a sinker fastball guy that buries it down in the zone where that profile is of course field more than Nola has pitched in the last year and a half of his career, which has been the biggest issue to strike home run, which obviously does not play the course field. So pitcher profile, even though Nola was obviously the better pitcher of the two, like, no crap obviously just from career it's more profile wise I don't think he profiles better to course field with the way he's pitching the last year and a half which is leaving balls over the strike zone when he's trying to get put away pitches <clears throat> which is just going to murder you in course field that, that's the only thing that would worry me coming into this game especially because the Rockies are somehow 6-3 uh, so they did get off to a good start they're riding high on their momentum early on in the season. So, uh, hopefully the Phillies can stunt that momentum, but I don't know how confident. Like, I hope he proves me wrong, but I don't, I'm don't. i not uber confident in Aaron Ola going to this game, put it that way. Not that I think Chad Cole's great. That That's what I'm not trying. That's what I'm trying to stress. I don't yeah. think that. It's just I think he profiles better as a pitcher the way he pitches to Coors Field at Aaron Old. No, I hear that. And until these starting pitchers give you a reason to believe, I, I get the, I get the uh, troublesome. Where game two, I think we have the advantage. Gibson, I think, profiles. If you can get first game Kyle Gibson, he profiles perfectly to being able to do good sinking fastball, keeps it down in the zone when he's at his best, already has 16 Ks. And when you look at some of the guys that have at-bats against him in the Rockies lineup, he actually has pitched fairly well against guys. And then Freeland has only had spurts ever since his rookie season, and he hasn't really been the same since other than spurts. So if you can get off to him early, he's already been bad in two starts. He has a 10 ERA. If you could jump on him, that's the game I think the Phillies have the best chance of winning the series because I really like how Gibson at his best can profile to Coors Field. And obviously, I think the Phillies have the Castellanos of the world. Um, playing lefties, having JT, who's on fire this year. Hopefully, Gene Segura is in the lineup then. Uh, you're going to be able to kind of smoke somebody like him as long as he's keeping the ball over the strike zone and struggling mightily like he has in his first two starts. 
which he hasn't shown you any signs to think he's going to just click it in in his third start, but it wouldn't be the first time someone's done that against the Phillies. But uh, I think that game to me profiles as a higher percentage win than the first game, so to speak. Myth? No, I can play agree with that. Obviously, if you get a, a, a seven shutout performance from Gibson, um, or sorry, seven seven inning performance from Gibson, you're looking pretty good. Um, I worry about our road performances. Obviously, they haven't always been the best, but we'll see what happens. I think we get two out of three in the series, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I hope you're right. I mean. I mean, well, the other I think, problem is we, I thought we had a huge pitching matchup on paper t- in today's game, um, and look how that turned out. So, well, I do agree with you. We can only take that with the grain of salt. Then. Mm-hmm. Gibson's honestly the guy, though, and coming into the season, this is another thing I didn't think I would believe in because you, I texted you before the season that I'm weary about Kyle Gibson with how he pitched for the Phillies. Now I think he's the guy I'm the most confident in pitching. So, so it's amazing how things change quickly. Uh, but that's the other reason why I think, uh, he, uh, has the best chance to win. And then another guy too, because we know how good he has a sinking fastball himself at his best. If Eflin can even just give you the four innings of his first start in Coors Field, and then the bullpen can pick up like the Norwoods of the world, the Bellatis of the world can pick you up again. I think you can win two out of three because I don't expect Zach Eflin to go out there and pitch seven shots. If he does, fantastic. But I don't expect him to do that. So if he can even just give you that four, four and a third type game that he was able to do in the first game, and you can go out and hit your mom, Marquez, who I believe, if I remember correctly, isn't he the one that usually struggles in cores and has really good road numbers? Yes. So, yeah, so he's in cores. So uh, you you might be able to knock him around, and if um, I'm a simple Velasquez, where did that come from? <laughs> and if Eflin can keep the ball down and be a guy that actually pitches like he is at his best, which was the first four innings, uh, into the fourth inning, then he fell off the tires a little bit in that first start. Then I think you can definitely go two out of three. But I think that third game compared to the second, that's why I need Gibson to be the guy that can pitch six and a third or something like that. So then you can have the Norwoods, Velades, and all those guys, even if Jones is up and Sanchez is there, it's just they're doing this rotation with the AAA is there at that point. Whoever's up that can give you inning. If they can piggyback well, like they've been doing most games this far. Uh, that's how I think you can win two out of three. Cause I feel like Gibson and Eflin, when they're at their best profile, better to success in course field than Aaron Nolan does right now with how he's struggled in the last year. Oh, yeah, no, I can play agree with that. And that's the only – and then also Bryce Harper kills um, your mom, Marquez. So that's also helpful. And so does JT Romuto, and so does Kyle Schwarber, and so does Gene Schwarber. So yeah. all yeah, we that. We well. He struggles in course, so. Yeah, all of that put together, I think, uh, makes me think we have a good chance to win two out of three. It's more, I think – you look at it as Nola has a better chance to succeed. I look at it as I think Gibson's a guy that I, I see stepping up more from that six, seven. And then, hey, if, you, if you take game one, you could be truly looking at a sweep. Potentially, yeah, because of what I just said. I, I have confidence in Gibson and Eflin. For, Eflin more so for like the shorter outing, but just giving me a good shorter outing. And then piggybacking off of the bullpen. And then Gibson, I think, is the guy that could go deeper into the game. Because Eflin... Uh, seems like he's not fully stretched out. And even though in game one, I think I would have let him go five because he was good in that game, but he was also not so good then afterwards. So uh, we'll have to see, though. I think this is a game Eflin has the profile to potentially pitch good against because the only guy he really – he struggles against two key guys in the lineup, but everyone else does not have big enough sample size to say, like, like McMahon hits 667 against him, but that's in three at bat. So, like, <laughs> like that's not a sample size. So – um, I hope he's able to bounce back because I think Eflin, what was it, 19 when he went on that really good run? Was that the 20s? Because remember he went on that, whenever he went on that really good run, if Eflin can even get to 80% of that, 
that's huge because if you can have Gibson continue to pitch, you have Wheeler because Wheeler I'm not overly concerned about even after his crap out and today just because I knew he wasn't going to be um, the best coming in because he barely was able to really pitch and ramp up yet. Where Noel is more concerning since Noel was kind of able to kind of stay more par for course and still hasn't necessarily been the best. But Suarez, Gibson, and then if you can get Eflin going, you still got three into Wheeler and then hopefully Nola um, comes along. So <clears throat> I do think the rotation is going to balance out. Maybe there's somebody out there that you can find basically to help that out. Uh, eventually, if you ever need more help as well, like a veteran that you can grab. Uh, or there's somebody in the free agency that looks really good that a tryout like players tend to do in the first couple months of the season at time. Whatever. Um, but we'll have to see going forward. But so to speak, like you said, that's definitely one of my closing keys. The starting pitching needing to step up on top of the lineup needing to step up uh, because the uh, relief pitching has actually been something that's been a great surprise early because not not that you didn't expect the guys that we got that were big time to do good, but we also have guys like Norwood, Bellotti, and others like that doing well as well. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I, I think that's a huge key. The offense is going to have to turn around, but I, I think my, my key is you need you need starts from your starters. You're going to need um, you, you need to go deeper than three, four innings, and it's it's two weeks into the year now. I, I think you have to start stretching them. I don't think you really have a choice almost at this point. Your bullpen can only take so much here, and down at the end of the month, you have to cut another two guys to get back down to the 26 once they take away the extended roster a little bit so i mean i i think it's you're two weeks in it's time for your starting pitching to show up yeah, uh, i get the I guys get, that i think i, will I get the offense i get the I offense has been bad but a 5.82 era is not going to cut it and that's what you're at right now two two weeks into the season and that's just again you can go out and score six runs but if you're giving up five runs a game as a starter, and then your bullpen comes in, and they're not going to be lights out every night, so you got to figure they're going to have a little bit of an ERA as well. So you can't afford five. five yeah, obviously, your back end, but not not your top. Right now, we don't have one starter you can rely on. No, yeah, the guy I'm the most confident in is Gibson, but he had a bad second outing and a great first outing, so they, you can't really rely on it. Yet. But, um. <clears throat> I mean, my big thing is I kind of expect, like, I, I didn't think Zach Wheeler was going to be Zach Wheeler early because he was coming off of the sore on there, taking it slow. But other guys, um, Ranger, I'm not surprised he's looked better than Wheeler with less uh, pitching time because he's also a guy that doesn't rely on being a fireball or he's a strike thrower. But Wheeler has to get ramped up to be the gunner he is and all that when ranger doesn't have to do that he's just a great pinpoint accuracy uh breaking ball guy that throws dotted two seamers and four seamers so to speak uh so it, it kind of works differently with those guys but i think what we're kind of just seeing is you have three pitchers in your rotation that are working their way back from something Eflin's working his way back from something ranger's working his way back from a having visa issues so not having the same amount and then uh, Wheeler's working his way back from being banged up, um, and that doesn't usually equate to success early, which is hopefully something that balances itself out in the future going forward, that these guys start to look more like their best selves rather than still really trying to knock off the rust working their way back from something selves. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. But, but that that's kind of my biggest uh yeah. that's why like when you were saying in the offseason we kind of could have got another veteran pitcher or like a Montes or something i was for that as well because that's an issue when you have three guys in a five-man rotation that are all coming back from something no, exactly. you kind of want to have more security yeah no, that's my point but uh, speaking on the fact of having more security, there is another guy that we can wrap this up because we went really long with this episode. Um, but uh, it's okay because we got a whole start of the season. It was a fun episode to do, so I don't really care if we were long. Whoever wants to listen, if you want to skip around, it's whatever. 
And um, so we don't forget, you can follow him at AJ underscore Santangelo, me at JJ Borak 26. But to wrap up the podcast, Michael Conforto, what's your interest level in him since he's, I would say, a B level fielder, maybe B minus in center field compared to the corners, but is obviously a very solid profile hitter for Citizens Bank Park. That's a good power uh, guy that might profile what is Citizens Bank Park. What would be your interest gauge in him? Uh, for taking the center field job since he's still an option. Oh, my interest level is 10 out of 10. I mean, I think you're desperate at this point. We, we talked about the struggles of Matt Verrilli. We talked about the struggles uh, at, at, at the position as a whole. Um, we already know with the Dubo Herrera coming back, we already know how bad he is. Um, you don't know what you're getting out of Mickey Moniak. Obviously, he had a great spring, but after a broken hand, you don't know how. Um, successful he's going to be. He might need... And how uh, long it'll take him to get back. Yeah, he might need a month down the minors. So my interest level in Conforto is 10 out of 10. I mean, worst case is you, you sign him to a one-year deal. You tell Moniak, hey, just get healthy. Worry about your hand. Get back to 100% and job is yours next year as long as you play well in the minors. Um, obviously, you traded Hazel in the offseason. So I think that was a step in the right direction for Mickey. But Again, he got hit in the hand. We don't know what he's going to be like when he comes back. Obviously, I hope the best, and and I think he has the potential to be a fantastic player. But I, I'd be all for one year, whatever it takes. That way, you're already over the luxury tax. It's a one-year deal. You don't have to worry about it carrying over to next year. I know how concerned our front office can be with that. You do one year. You just take the hit this year. You get a, a proven – I'm either been the biggest – fan of him and, and Mike Conforto, but he's 10 times better than what we got right now. And um, I'd be all for a move like that just because you need that spot. And again, you don't know what Mickey's going to be when he gets back with that hand injury. So uh, I'm, I'm for it. And I think until Mickey can prove he's ready, because he comes back and struggles, you're sitting in the same situation because the situation is you don't have other options to try. Like there's no other there's no other options right now, so I'm all no, You only have the guys that are up right now, Odubel, and then yeah, that's it. That's all you have right now until Mickey Cunningham comes up, um, which the two guys that are up right now are definitely better at fielding than they are hitting, uh, unless if one of them gets going more. And then Odubel, we'd like you said, has a lot of flaws. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that you were a 10 out of 10 because of the second part of what your statement was, which you're not even the biggest fan of Michael Conforto, but. But it's more from the stance of we just don't have much. Well, where me, I've wanted him kind of all along in the offseason. We were texting about Michael Conforto months ago uh, because I've always liked him as a player. And I also like taking people from rivals. So that's always a fun thing to do. Uh, but I think he would just profile well with citizens just because he's a guy that can hit 25 to 30 with being able to get the barrel rate up more. Um, which I think it seems like we have a hitting coach that obviously long that does the best at getting the best out of guys like Moniak who had struggle money periods where like the guys you said that struggled early this season, you've made a good point like Harper Schwartz, but they usually struggle in April. So, but other guys like Castellanos, Bones doing fantastic. Uh, Like you see things, uh, Gregorius is having good competitive at bats minus the one game he went over five, Stott, even when getting out, is that competitive at bats, in my opinion. So, like, I think Wong's doing a good job uh, bringing Conforto. I think he might even have one of his better seasons here on a one year because he's going to try to prove it to get a four year contract. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, after exactly. This season. So, like, I think that might be a reason why it's uh, even a good signing as well. Exactly. Uh, uh, I agree with you. Then, go ahead. That's I agree with you. And my point is, in the offseason, when I said no, thank you, it's because I wanted Nick Castellanos and or Kyle Schwarber, and we ended up first signing one of them, and then we got both of them. So now, again, it's the, it's more of a desperation move. Is we need we can't keep going out with an eight-man lineup. So we can use Rilling in the seventh through ninth inning all we want for defense. And, I mean, you stack that offense. Actually, what the, I would do you there, because the I think Beer you get the lead, and then you you take you pull Kyle or Nick and left move Conforto to left, and and put Verling in center for the, the seventh through ninth inning if you have the lead. So, okay. and then you move Camargo to third, and your defense is fine at that point. 
what I would do there, actually, just because Joe Girardi's talked about how he still thinks highly of Beerling as a prospect as a whole, I feel like it might make more sense for him to start in the minors just to get his back going more, where you're just subbing a guy in for defense anyway. The calling card of Simon Muziati isn't hitting, as you as we talked about before the podcast, other than in the minors. He actually is a decent contact rate hitter in the minors, but he hasn't shown that yet in the big. Hey, it's fielding. If you're just subbing a guy in for fielding and speed anyway, he's probably honestly faster than Veerling and is a fielder. So you might as well, like, if he if you don't think he's going to develop into anything more than just that, if that's what the Phillies think his ceiling is, just being an extra fielding outfielder, where if they think Veerling's ceiling's higher, if you get what I'm saying, I would yeah. let Veerling get more at-bats in the minors and then just let Muziati be the fielding guy you sub in later because that's all he's doing anyway or the pinch runner you sub in at time because you don't need him to be the perfect hitter. If he hits 230, the few games you put him in and feels really well when he starts, then that's all you really care about. The like few and far between games you would start in that instance. So um, that's the other thing. That's kind of just looking at it from how I think the Phillies, from how you listen to Joe Girardi talk about Deerling, thinks he's probably has a higher ceiling than Muziotti. That's why it would make more sense to let him get his back going in the minors, where if you think Muziotti is always just a extra outfielder anyway, which is what his scouting report says his profile was an extra defensive whiz outfielder. If you go back and uh, look at it, because Zach and I looked at it the other day, um, I would say that's the perfect guy to keep up for the instance you said, and then let Beerling try to develop into something more than that so he can kind of be a guy that can play all three positions, but also hit at least 260 and be a good fielder because we saw the, his good bat to ball skills last year. He just hasn't shown it yet this year. Well, not all the time, actually, this year. He does. He has shown it at times with hard lineouts. It's just he hasn't shown it being able to find the get hitch this year, translating it to hitch minus the one win against the fish. Yeah, no, I can play everything. Um, but but unless if you had uh, anything else as uh, wrap-up points, uh, I think we had a pretty good long uh, show here, but a good show, uh, which is good to go long sometimes and you have a lot to talk about. And it's been a while since we've talked about stuff. Uh, yeah, I think we touched on everything. Um, nah, I'm, I'm good. All right, well, I really thank everybody for joining us for this latest Sports Fanatic News um, Phillies edition as I'm joined by Andrew Santangelo, AJ underscore Santangelo on Twitter. Give him a follow over there. And I have Joe JJ Borick 26 on Twitter as well as Sports Fanatic News, of course, YouTube. We upload this on. Please continue to subscribe there. We appreciate your love and support this far. Have a great day, everybody, and go Phillies. Let's turn it around against those Rockies.